Ses kontrol. Tamam. Somebody should keep the time. Okay. 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 So I'm going to use the board and try to write as big as possible. So, but still, if you sit a little bit in the front seat, it will be better. Like no. I'm not going to prepare lecture notes. Kullanabilir miyim? Okay, harika. Okay. So this is my name, John Kozjas. Uh, I also, s for the, our, for our guests from uh, foreign countries, this is how you pronounce my name. Not Khan or Can or Jan, as some people make up. So I will be teaching some filter lectures. First of all, let me tell you, I'm not going to be able to teach field theory. So you will, after the first week, start doing QFT computations. So the lectures are not aimed to do research in quantum field theory, but they are aimed to make you familiar with the concepts. And when your other lecturers are talking about standard model or QCD, you understand what they're talking about. So that's going to be my aim. And before I talk about the outline of my like you know, 10 lectures, I want to say a couple words about the uh, second week. Because I got some questions about this parallel sessions of the theory lectures. So the idea is, since we all gathered here, and since some of you are interested in theory or doing research in theory, we decided to have parallel sessions in a little bit more advanced topics. And we decided like, to have as a team non-perturbative physics. Because most, most of the things you will see in the first week in the theory lectures are going to be perturbative. Either Feynman diagrams or like, you know, where you assume the coupling constant is small or when you are doing standard model scatterings, they are going to be all perturbative computations. So the second week's team is going to be non-perturbative computations. Um, this will include the introduction of non-perturbative obje objects such as monopoles, instantons, vortices. And one of the most important theories where we had a very good handle on non-perturbative effects is like N equals 2 theory, N equals 2 supersymmetric gauge theories, where there is a solution offered in the mid-90s by Seibach and Witten. So the solution will be presented. And this is going to like you know bring up to the like you know current research because there are like many advances happening currently about n equals two theories. So in that regard, if you pick up a paper, so you will know what you're ta what they're talking about. Then, in the solution of cyborg written, there is this concept of duality, which was also a very important issue in 90s for theoretical and for field theories as well as the string theorists. So that's why some introduction to dualities will follow. And then we want to go and we want to move on with the, so, uh, with the ADS safety correspondence. So this is a correspondence between a gauge theory and gravitational theories. And there have been like you know, many applications of ADS CFT. So our aim is to make you, or to unfortunately only to some of you, to make you pick up a paper and see what they're talking about. And there are going to be some also QCD lectures and some different methods of QCD will be introduced, which may include like you know, some rules, also lattice maybe, depending on the availability of the possible lecturers. Okay, so this is about the second week and maybe people who are interested in attending those like more, a uh, little bit more advanced theory lectures should contact me and we may eventually select some of you to that. So that being said, let me give a brief, brief outline of what I want to talk about in these lectures. So in my first two lectures, what I'm aiming is 
to start with the classical field theory. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the basic concepts of the fl classical field theory, such as how you get the equations of motion, how you uh, get the con concept of currents from symmetries, which is a Noether's theorem, and we want to quantize the classical fields. But before we quantize, I want to talk about the properties we want to like impose so we have like a consistent theory. Then I'm going to quantize the simplest field theory possible, in my opinion. That's the Klein-Gordon field. And for that, I'm going to start with the simple harmonic oscillators and you know, show you the procedure. Later in tomorrow lectures, hopefully if I like finish with what I am in this first two four, first four lectures, I will start with the functional methods, which is I'm going to try to introduce a Feynman path integral. And using the path integral, we can, I will show you how to compute the multipoint functions. And the last four lectures, hopefully, will be deserved for gauge theories. I'm going to introduce with the abelian one, which is which QED is a good example, and then move on to non-abelian ones, for which, for example, you have QCD. And for that, I'm going to introduce a little bit Lie groups, Lie algebras, which are also going to be introduced in the standard model lectures. And then, depending on the time, we will go on. We can go on with quantizing non-abelian gauge theories, or talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, which I know you have been already told, and you will be told again. So I may not be talk about that. Maybe I briefly mention anomalies, or talk about um, effective the theories. I mean, what do I mean? If you if you have like non-generalizable terms, what do they mean? in the effective action, or if you take it as an effective theory. So do you have any questions before we start? OK. So let me start. As I said, I'm, I want to start with uh, classical field theories. And I want to introduce the basic concepts. OK. So OK, classical field. And please let me know if you cannot read my handwriting because I'm pretty sure eventually it's going to be really unreadable, especially in the fourth lecture today. So we have two different approaches, as like in classical mechanics. So we have the Lagrangian ap ap approach and Hamiltonian. Oh. Maybe, okay, I should maybe start with motivation for field theory, which I don't think it's necessary because I think in this crowd, everybody knows QFTs are required to understand the basic interactions in nature. And as I said, I mean, one of the, like, you know, if the one of the easiest things is, I mean, quantum mechanics doesn't include special relativity. And we know nature has special relativity. And it has this famous formula So you can actually start with energy, collide particles, uh, collide like particles with high energy and create like in other particles. So the particle number is not conserved, which is not the case in quantum mechanics. So you need a formalism which allows like in scattering experiments, you know, to get many particles. Also, you will have issues it's about causality, right? Two space-like separated events should not inc uh, affect each other. And quantum field theory is the answer for those kind of questions. It's going to have like you know, the approach which allows you to deal with the uh, with like that kind of scattering processes as well as enforces like you know the theory to be ca causal. And as I said, the standard model is like you know a special case of a field theory. Okay, let me continue. So. So we have like two approaches. One of them is Lagrangian formalism. The other is a Hamiltonian. So, and of course they have both advantages and disadvantages for its own, for their own. So, so the Lagrangian is more manifest if you want to like you know think about the symmetries of the theory, whereas Hamiltonian approach is making a uh, closer connection to the what you know from quantum mechanics. Okay. So I want to talk about both of them separately. So let me start with the Lagrangian approach. So what is the basic object? Okay, what's the fundamental quantity 
of Lagrangian formula formulation. So as you know, fundamental quantity is the action. Okay, let me also write this. Action, and we are going to denote it by S. Okay? And you know if you the action is written as the time integral of the Lagrangian. Okay? In field theory, we will be we are going to use Lagrangian, but we are going to actually like you know use what's called the Lagrangian density, which is which is if you integrate over the volume, so the three volume will give you the uh, will give you the Lagrangian. Okay. So the Lagrangian density, although it's a density because I mean if you integrate it over the volume form, you get the Lagrangian. Although it's Lagrangian density, most textbooks and most physicists when they refer to it, it they refer to it as the Lagrangian. So they don't say Lagrangian density. So I'm going to probably also say Lagrangian whenever I actually mean Lagrangian density. And the Lagrangian density is a function of the fields and the derivative of the fields with respect to space-time coordinates. And if you actually like, you know, combine these two, you will be writing dt, the volume form. And let me say like you know like a little bit more explicit like phi and space derivatives of phi okay and you can also write this i mean you probably also know this you can write this as the invariant volume element d for x so this is going to be the space time invariant volume element like in quantum like in classical mechanics you know in law we also have the principle of least action to get the equations of motion. Least action. So I'm not doing something wrong, right? And I assume everybody knows classical mechanics at this level. Like you know Hamiltonian and Lagrangian formulations. Right? Okay, good. So what does the principle of least action says, let me read from my notes and don't write on the board. So the system, okay, now we are not talking about particles anymore. It's, I mean, in the classical mechanics, the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian formulation, what you're looking at, you start at the initial point, you d determine like a final point, and you look all the possible paths, right? And you write down the action, and you are looking for the path which minimizes, ex extremizes, which is usually the minimum, which extremizes like you know that action from the initial point to the final point. Here, since we are talking about fields, we will be talking about a field configuration. So at the initial time, we will have a field configuration, and that will evolve in time to another field configuration. And you can define the action. And the principle of least, a least action for the field theorist tells that path, like that evolution, will be extremized for the solution. So then which means the variations, the variation of the action along the classical like evolution will be zero, the, the, the variations. Okay, which means if I write this, if I go back to my definition of the action, so I can move this variation since this variation is like, I'm, and I'm going to like, you know, tell you some properties of the variation, but for the moment, take, I mean, take my word. So I can move inside the integral because I'm varying, varying with respect to the fields, not with respect to space time. So I can write this as So I can play with it a little bit since 
Okay, what can I do? What I can do is I can write this as I can use the chain rule. So I just leave the first term as it is. Then I So I didn't do nothing but rewriting the second term. I just pulled the derivative outside, used the chain rule, and that's why I get this term. But what I can argue is that this term is 0. It's 0. So one of the reasons is why it's 0, because I'm going to assume, as I said, I mean, the principle of least action takes you from one initial field configuration to the other one. So at the points, like in at the T1 and T2, you assume the field configuration is not changing. So here, I have this like, you know, I mean, this is a total derivative volume, so I can apply the Stokes theorem. So that's going to only get, get co contribution at the spatial and temporal um, endpoint of the integration or the boundaries. So the temporal boundaries are T1 and T2, let's say, and I'm assuming the field configuration is not fixed there. So that's why it gives you zero. Also, I'm going to assume the variations of like, you know, delta phi are vanishing at the boundaries of, like, you know, of my space, which is usually taken to be infinite. So this part is zero. So when this is zero, I mean, oops, sorry. The derivative, this derivative is not acting on the variation. The, my bad. So I mean here, the derivative is acting on the whole thing, this derivative multiplying the variations in field. But here, the derivative is acting only on the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to the derivative of the field. So I can factor this out. I can factor out this like you know, field conf field variations. When I do that. And the least action principle tells me zero. And this, is, this has to be true for any arbitrary variation of the field configuration around the, like, you know, the path which is extremizing. So that, that's why I'm getting the equations of motion, which are telling me it has to be zero. And Look, I mean, this is very similar to what we have already seen in the classical mechanics. Whereas, like, you know, phi is now replaced what we call, like, the coordinate. And here, this is, like, you know, the derivative with respect to time. Maybe with respect, yeah. But now we have, like, you know, we have derivatives with respect to all space-time coordinates. And also, they have the name. These are the Euler-Lagrange. equations of motion. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So let me go, maybe I should load faster. So let me go to the Neuter's theorem. So, you know, like, you know, also from classical mechanics that you have conservation laws. And the same thing, you have also conservation laws in, like, you know, classical field theory. And these are, like, you know, based on symmetries. Okay? So, symmetries are telling you conservation laws. Okay? How to derive them. So, imagine... I have a transformation and taking my field to like a psi prime 
and this is defined to be original field and some variation over that. Okay? So, this transformation is considered to be a symmetry of the equations of motion, not only when they leave the Lagrangian invariant, but I mean they're allowed to change it up to like you know four derivative, meaning up to a divergence term. Because if I add a divergence term to my Lagrangian density or Lagrangian, you know that's the action is going to be invariant, and I can do play the same game and I will end up with the same equations of motion. So the symmetries are not necessarily like you know leaving the Lagrangian density invariant, but they can change it up to a total derivative. So Lagrangian density can go. can change okay, up to a divergence term. Okay? So but I can but I can also write down, I mean since I know the Lagrangian density is a function of the fields and I know how the fields transform, I can also write down the variation of the Lagrangian due to this transformation independently. And let me also write it down. So alpha is going to be plus. So actually, I'm here doing nothing but Taylor expanding the Lagrangian in, 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 in with respect to it's like, you know, uh, arguments. And as you see, I have this parameter alpha, which is actually like, you know, a bookkeeping. Because here, alpha is, I'm assuming alpha is very small. And I'm putting explicitly alpha so I can keep track to which order I'm expanding my Lagrangian, the change in my Lagrangian. And I'm keeping it only to up to linear terms. So alpha is useful for that reason. And as I did here, that I erased, like, you know, I wrote down the, this derivative as a total, uh, as a, like, you know, derivative of the index. So I'm going to play the same game here. I plus alpha. And you see immediately by doing this change, I got something which is equal to zero. Because I mean, if the field phi is obeying the classical equations of motion, the Euler Lagrange equation tells me this beast here is equal to zero. So what do I do? So this okay, has to be equal to that. Then I have alpha mu j mu is equal to alpha okay. and the lucky part is like I mean as I said that's the use of alpha and it, it drops out at the end and shows me what I'm doing is consistent. I'm just doing all everything at the same order. And both both sides are actual total derivatives, so I can collect them into a divergence, which is then okay. And this I'm going to define as with lowercase j, and that vanishes. The divergence of J, I mean, I considered, I mean, I look at the symmetries, right? I said, okay, the Lagrangian density has changed up to this, which is 
leaving the equations of motion invariant, then Taylor expand to the same order. Okay, then I combine them together and get got a current, okay, which whose divergence is zero, vanishing. What? Why is it important? It's important because it's the same as, let's say, the energy conservation. If you, if your system is invariant under time, uh, time dilatations, then it's going to be in, uh, it's, the energy is going to be conserved. If you have the rotational symmetry, you have the angular momentum conserved. If you have the linear, if your system is uh, invariant under linear transformations in coordinates, then it's the momentum is conserved. And whenever you have a conserved quantity, you can integrate it out and get the solution easily. So that's why, I mean, we would like to deal with the, uh, with this currents, conserved currents, because as I said, as I was trying to argue, they are leading to oh, space, which it does zero. If you integrate of the zero component of J over the whole space, you get like, you know, a charge which is conserved in time. So the dot means here the time derivative. And I encourage you, if you are not familiar with this, I encourage you to really understand how we go from this statement to this conserved charge. Okay? So there is another interesting thing you can get using Noether's theorem, but now I'm not varying with respect to the, I mean I'm not varying the field, but I'm going to look at the transformation of the space-time. And let me say, uh, let me look at the relations, okay. Again, Noether's theorem applied to space-time transformations. So here I mean, let's boost, uh, let's like move them from x to another coordinate, x mu minus a mu. And of course, under this change, now my field is going to be transformed as, transformed as well. So the what I call phi of x will go phi of x plus a. Ah, okay. Maybe it's a good point for me to tell you about my notation. So when I'm writing down like x or a, I usually don't put, if I don't put any s bar, I mean the four vectors. And I will try to keep track, hopefully I will be able to consistently do throughout the whole my whole lectures, if I say x bar, I mean the spatial like in you know, a part of a four vector. Okay, and usually, okay, another thing, if I just, let's say, I mean, put a dot and write this, I mean the three, I mean the spatial part of the scalar product of spa spatial part, and when I write like Px, what I really mean is the four-dimensional like scalar product. So if you are confused, it's probably I'm not following my conventions, and please let me know. Okay, so then this is going to be this. So again, let me tailor expand this around x and keep to the first order in A. Okay. And here, as I said, A is infinitesimal decimal. okay but I want to remark one thing here okay we had uh, one parameter one deformation parameter so we were actually like in deforming uh, defining our transformation with respect to one parameter family of like you know objects but here since it's space time and I have like four dimensions. Actually, I have like four independent parameters with which. So here, on this uh, on this 
part like you know since we have only one parameter we get one equation and you should actually think guess if I have multiple parameters I should get multiple equations and that's th that that's the reason why I'm writing it is again Taylor expanding but because of the reasons I, I told you I am using this funny notation or like I'm just doing something kind of redundant or it may seem redundant at first okay you, you know you can contract with the Kronecker Delta and then you can actually get the same thing but I'm just like you know keeping new and mu separate and like you know absorb it with the Kronecker Delta for the moment which will be clear in a second okay so let's apply the Neuter's uh, theorem essentially so these are okay let me have to distinguish that so these are my okay so what I'm going to do a new delta phi like I did here will be equal to because the variation of like you know of the field is like you know given by this derivative and I'm going to plug this here for this delta delta phi delta delta phi okay so this I mean everything combined together So I didn't do anything but what I did here. I have my the transformation of my field. So I ex see explicitly how the field is deformed, and I just plugged it this in here, and I also like you know find my J capital J by looking at the variation of the Lagrangian density, and combine them together as I did here. So since I'm not getting any questions, everything's clear, right? Okay, let me then collect terms. So then I will have, again, as I said, I mean, it's always to keep, like, you know, a parameter. Like, if you are doing that, looking at the transformation, it's always useful to keep, like, a parameter explicit because if you get an expression like this and in more complicated computation, you it's kind of check, like, you know, you, you might be doing something right because, I mean, it's, again, at the same order. Especially if you're expanding, like, you know, two things, like, separately, you want to keep everything at the same order. So I can combine everything together. So when I apply Neuter's theorem, so space-time transformation, I get something conserved again. And this is a very important object and deserves like, you know, a special name. I'm sure you have seen it before, T menu. It's either referred as stress energy tensor. or energy momentum tensor.
Okay. Now this, this is J for this deformation transformation, because okay, J capital J, yes. No, no, no. This this is L. This is correct. But this object, okay. So let me, if I go back, in Neurotus, when I'm driving the Neurotus theorem, what I said is L will be go L plus J mu, right? So then, so here, okay, I just said, okay, I mean, if, like, you know, transformation, this is going to, the way how much L is going to change, and then this is actually my J in that, and then I plug that J into this, like, you know, final equation, okay. Sure. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I. Mm, hold on. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Huh. Oh, that's a good question. Good point. Mm hmm. -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I will, like, you know, I mean, tell more about, like, you know, I mean, you, you will see in a minute, I mean, after I introduce the Hamiltonian formulation, actually, you will see why it's called, like, the energy momentum tensor, because we are going to relate some components of this T mu nu tensor to momentum and, like, energy. Okay, and you may have, okay, let me uh, also make a remark. So you can also, like, you know, get T menu, T menu, T menu is proportional. The variation, okay, pro of action with respect to the metric. So you sometimes you also use that, like, you know, definition. But purposes, since we are like you know going to be always on flat space time, this is like I mean, you know, you don't need to like worry about it too much. Okay. So this is all I wanted to say about the Lagrangian formulation. Like you know, how to get the equations of motion, how you get the conserved currents or charges from the symmetries of the Lagrangian. Any questions so far? So, I assume you don't need a break, right? 45 minutes? I continue. Okay. So, okay, the second approach is the Hamiltonian. Formulation. As I pointed out, the connection to the quantum mechanics, or things we know, is going to be more transparent in the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian formulation. So we all know how to how the Hamiltonian is defined in classical mechanics. So you just look at the Legendre transformation of the Lagrangian. And here Pi is the canonical momenta. So this is like you know classical mechanics. We are all in love. At least I am. Anyway, so similarly, here we are going to define the conjugate momenta. As I said, I mean, from the Euler-Lagrange equation, it should be already clear, the fields are going to replace the coordinates. And so I can actually define the canonical, canonical co conjugate momenta to them by simply, as I did, like, you know, the derivative, by simply taking what's called the functional derivative of the Lagrangian density. Okay, this is not manifestly Lorentzian invariant at the moment, but 
that's my like you know conjugate momenta momentum correspond to the field and i will i'm going to like t tell a little bit more i mean just a little bit more about the functional uh functionals but yes they also if you're here let me tell you a couple words so usually we have functions which take from let's say uh, variables to i mean from a numbers to numbers here a functional is which takes you which takes a like you know a function and maps it to a number like in the action right in the action you have fields you have functions because i mean fields are uh, functions of space time and it takes like those functions and creates a number and that's why we differentiate the, them by calling them functionals because they are like functions but they are not exactly functions and then the path integral actually is like you know the the integral corresponding integral of functionals and this like you know functional derivative is the corresponding functional differentiation okay and i as i said i'm going to talk more about them uh in the fifth or sixth lecture okay and here actually this is okay i was a little bit sloppy this wasn't only momentum, but only conjugate. This is like the momentum density. Okay? And as I said, since I don't want to talk about functionals in detail at this point, let me give a very hand wavy argument why it's like, you know, why it's called like a density. But as I said, this is going to be a very hand wavy argument. So, Px is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the field. And what's my what's Lagrangian? The Lagrangian is is the space space vo uh, volume integral of the Lagrangian density. Okay, so. So this is the real hand wavy part. So let me assume this is as a like sum over space time points or space time volumes. And this is what any Riemann integral is, right? You just like you subdivide and you sum over all possible volume elements. And then I will have L okay as a and then you either call it D cube or call up to you, right? And now from this definition, you see if I'm just like this will act on this, so then I will have this pi summed over space. So actually, this is not the momentum you get, but this is like you know, it will give you the momentum if you integrate over the space. That's why I mean by from this definition, if you do if you differentiate in terms of functionals with respect to the the time derivative of the field, you will get not the momentum but the momentum density. Then the Hamiltonian. has a similar form which I'm going to also write it as a density So here I had a disc discrete set of variables that I summed, but here I have like infinitely many fields, actually uncountably infinite many fields because it, I mean you can think of like in a vari or variable because I'm just like you know for each point in space time I'm, uh, in space I'm associating a field, so that's why I'm just like integrating. That's how I define my Hamiltonian. Okay, and. 
so far you may think everything is formal. And I think the lectures are going to be a little bit formal because um, I'm doing more formal stuff in my research, so I tend to do, do things more formal. And you have like, you know, more than 10 lectures about applications of these ideas, you know, to the real time, real physics. So I just want to like give you a little bit about formalism. Okay, so, but this doesn't stop me giving you an example. Imagine you have a Lagrangian density of this form. I dot square. And you can write it down as, you can combine these two together, write it as in many textbook you will see this is written as this. If the, if the space-time metric is not important, if you're on flat space-time, it's written like this, or even sometimes they even like, you know, drop the, you know, the index and write it like phi, del, del phi square. Okay? So, if you, I mean, that's what you need to check yourself, not as a homework, but you will have other things for the homework. So the let you can compute the equation of motion. You can take this Lagrangian, lock this in into the Euler-Lagrangian equation, and get the equations of motion. And I encourage you to do it yourself. What you will get is what's called the Klein-Gordon equation. Oops. Zero. And moreover, the momentum density is, of course, is easy to compute if you take the functional derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to phi dot. You only get phi dot. Simple. So then you can go back and plug this in, get the Hamiltonian. From this, you get the Hamiltonian, which is Hamiltonian density. So this is your Hamiltonian density. Okay. It's very straightforward. So this is the end of what I wanted to say about classical fields in general. So any questions? I have time until 12.30, right? EPR paradox? Yes. Because I mean that's a question about the causality. I mean you don't need you, you don't even need to look there to resolve it, I guess. Yeah. I think like, you know, I mean EPR paradox is about hidden variables, right? And hidden variables has been ruled out by the Bell's equality and experiments. I don't know. Do we need field theory? Yes and no. Uh, I don't know. What about it? I mean, 
I mean, similar ideas will lead to, I mean, let's say the Dirac quantization, quantization of an electric charge. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're very well understood, like Arnold Boyle, in fact, even within the quantum mechanics. Even within the quantum mechanics, it's under well understood. Yeah. Does QFT explain the peculiarity? Maybe I'm not talking about I mean resolving it. But okay, what's the peculiar about um, Aron Bohm effect? There's no magnetic field outside the uh, what was solenoid. The pipe? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean you can have a solenoid and solenoid an infinite solenoid and a thin solenoid doesn't have a magnetic field outside either. Okay, but the particle moving around it. Uh, Picks up a phase, yeah. Yeah, but the two particles when when they send two particles, so they are supposed to pick up the same phase. So sorry, no, the they other are not. Around. But like, I don't understand what's peculiar with that. I mean, you have you see the interference pattern, mm -hmm. and you can understand in terms of quantum mechanics. I don't need to. I I don't understand why do you need to quantize like you know you need to understand at the level of quantum I mean quantum field theory. So no, I think you can come on. So this is the mass term. So this is the mass term, and this is the kinetic term. Yeah. Okay, I mean, as a, as a momentum carried by the field. Okay, so for example, from the electromagnetism, you know that the electromagnetic fields carry energy, momentum, angular momentum. So that's not that momentum. The momentum carried by the field is not the uh, conjugate momentum. And I'm going to define, like, you know, when I quantize a Klein Gordon, I'm going to define the operator actually which uh, computes which is responsible, which is like, you know, the momentum carried by the field. That's not just pi. That is momentum density. Other than being the conjugate momentum. I mean, then y when we quantize, we are going to impose uh, computation relations on like, you know, the field and the conjugate momenta. Right now they're committing, right? I mean, you don't need to worry about the order of these two things.
actually about your question uh, Bob uh, yeah the vector potential yeah, I mean and that becomes important um, you will have like what's called like the a Dirac monopole and you will have the Dirac strings and where you will I mean if you want to define a consistently a mu then you need to introduce like you know some uh, yeah some divergences some like you know you need to like you know exclude certain regions and then they correspond to Dirac you know strings which are actually like you know like the there is a flux going in that string, a magnetic flux. No, no, I mean, no, it doesn't. A mu? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just shift. Oh, you mean like, you know, change it like in a different, you may like, you need to compute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, Delphi is not. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of shifting the whole, like, in a system. I mean, you have... Okay, I don't want to say it at this point, but, okay, so... You may have, like, you know, okay, things like this. So, I mean, this is actually one of the homework problems. So, in the Klein-Gordon, I mean, if you... The here, the in, the in the Klein-Gordon equation I wrote, this was, like, you know, the real fields. So, they were taking values in the reals. But you can also, like, you know, complexify them. You can consider them as, like, you know, complex field. And you may also have, like, you know, then you also, I mean, for example, in the question, as I said, in the homework, I mean, I said, okay, the complex clan Gordon has Lagrangian invariant on the, like, phase rotation. And here, when I say phase rotation, I just keep alpha constant and independent of the field. So, I mean, this is going to be a function of, like, x, but alpha is a constant real number okay and actually you can make it as a function you can take this and make it as a function so I mean at this level it's a global symmetry because it's valid throughout the whole space but if you make it like you know depend on time and depend on like coordinates then you it's you gauge it so th that becomes a gauge symmetry and then you need to introduce I mean, to preserve the sim as, a, as a symmetry, you need to pr you need to introduce like the connection, and actually that's how you get like how we can get the gauge transformations like in QED, in abelian gauge theories. If you start with the symmetry and gauge it, then you need to introduce the connection corresponding. I mean, okay, so you con I shouldn't say connection, but you need to compensate for the change, and then uh, then you get a different theory. And this is one example. Yeah. That's why uh, a, a, a was independent of the of the location. I mean, phi is like you know depend on the space. I mean, phi is changing everywhere. I mean, phi is a field. But I'm just shifting it. Okay. Okay. So in the remaining 25 minutes, I want to start quantizing the 
the classical field. So before, like, you know, working out an example of how to quantize a field, a classical field, I want to talk about um, the constraint, the physical constraint we have, like, you know, in quantization. And with every quantum mechanical system, one of the things you associate is a Hilbert space. Right? I mean, if you study the classical mechanics system, and you make a quantum mechanical, you need to introduce like, you know, Hilbert space and then observables and they have to correspond to operators and such. But the first thing you need to consider like, you know, Hilbert space. But as I said before, the Hilbert space we consider for quantum field theory should uh, not only like the Hilbert space of a certain number of particles, but allow, should allow a number of different particle numbers. That's why we are actually considering the Fox space. Okay. Okay, so you need this is the only time I'm going to use the Fox space and I'm kinda using the same letter I use, script letter I use for the Hamiltonian density. Just so this will be the tensor product of Hilbert spaces with zero particles, with now one particle, with two particles, three particles, and so on. I'm considering there's a huge Hilbert space, and this is my going to be my Fox, Fox space. Okay. So then, on this space, as I said, I want to talk about the physical constraints I have. The first, first constraint or the first property I want to have is the unitarity. So what's unitarity? It tells us that the conservation of probability. So in quantum mechanics, we associate like you know probabilities with the all po to each possible outcome, and the sum of the possible outcomes should add up to one. And that should be conserved over time. Okay, so it tells you at any time the sum of mutual exclusive is it events give one. So that will require us to assume or like to impose a unitary time evolution. So if we call the our like time evolution operator U, which is the exponential of the Hamiltonian, and usually I'm going to drop like H bar because they are one in the natural limit. If this time evolution is unitary to conserve the probability. H has to be Hermitian. Okay? Locality. So what do we mean with locality? Okay, so we know if we for any given point in time, if we look, I mean if you look events at like you know different space time points, space points, not time points, we are looking at the same time and we are looking at different times, uh, different space points. So the amplitude, I mean, the the physics is different. So they are not talking to each other. And which means the amplitude should be factorized for well-separated events. Well-separated, I mean um, space-like. So what does it mean? So it means, especially if we have uh, physical observables,
these ob these observables should commute for uh, space like separation separation meaning so if i have an operator a acting on x and look at its commutator with b at like another space time point y it's equal to 0 if x minus y square smaller than 0 moreover the time evolution should preserve this right i mean if i evolve in time that condition must be satisfied at all times so as i said before like for spatially separated events the amplitudes factorize and the reason is i mean because no signal can propagate faster than speed of light and it it factorizes it factorizes actually it also justifies our definition of Hamiltonian then in classical field theory because at a given time I can write my full home Hamiltonian as the spatial integral over the whole space because this is like at a given time and at a, at a given time these things points don't talk to each other they factorize the amplitude factorize if they factorize I should be able to write it as a, like in you know, a sum over all contributions from different points. No, no, no. It's a with a bar. Like there are four vectors there. There are four vectors here. That's why I just mean it can be less than zero. Okay. Here, yes. I mean they depend on time. But I'm looking here at, sorry? Yeah, no, I mean it's kind of redundant maybe, but I'm just, I want to emphasize that this, I mean, okay, you can, okay, let's do this. You can say this, A, X, T, B, Y, T, I'm looking at the same time, is equal, has to be equal to zero, four, Maybe okay. If you forget about this, I mean, this is the statement of this. I mean, if you if I look at it at the same time at different points, the operators should commute. Okay, and the time evolution should preserve it. But if you want to generalize it, I mean, then the space like separations, it should be zero. I mean, if I just think in terms of the four vectors. Okay, so then it means I mean the total energy is the sum of degrees of freedoms at each point okay so our system should be i mean it should be invariant under poincare transformation which include includes like you know the lorentz transformation as well as the special uh, sorry translations as we did like you know in the previous like example with this a and the particle states transform under unitary representations of the point carry group so say okay so we need to be Lorentz plus translation the other one is particle states transform under unitary representations perhaps of the point by group okay so the fourth condition is stability There is a state, okay, I mean, when I wrote down the, like, in the Fox space, I assume, like, you know, there is, a, there is, like, you know, a Hilbert space 
of zero particles. So this is going to be my vacuum state. And the, for the vacuum state to be stable, the Hamiltonian H needs to be bounded below. There is a fifth, and okay, these are the requirements, and the fifth one is the more peculiar one. So this is this goes under the name renormalizability. I mean, people, I mean, we don't like divergences, right? Yes. Sorry? Oh, the whole board, okay. Poincare invariant, Lorentz and transla plus translation. These are like, you know, the, I mean, Poincare group is consists of the Lorentz transformation plus the translations. So our theory should be invariant under these two. And the particle states transform under, okay. I see your point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm running out of time, so I should just the unitary rep reps representations of the point credit group. And this is a group, yeah. See, it's the second end of the second lecture. I, my hand is already illegible. Okay, how about this one? Okay, so Hamiltonian needs to be bounded below. Okay, I can't rewrite this. It doesn't go minus infinity. It has like an, a minimum, like the harmonic oscillator. Um, and this is the normalizability. So this is the okay, okay. This is going to be difficult, a little bit difficult. Uh, so the non-renormalizable theories are not bad if you know how to treat them. And one of the best examples to a non-renormalizable theory is general relativity. So, but it gives good results because we know how to handle it, how to like you know how to make sense of it. For example, if you take QED of electrons and photons, it's good, not all the way to infinitely high energy scatterings, but it's only good to the energies until you start creating muons. If you include muons in your theory, you know, then, then it's not, again, like good all the way to infinity energy, infinite energy, but it's good until you start creating taus. Okay? So that's what I mean with, like, if you know how to handle your theory. So if I like have the QED of with only electrons, I should say, okay, I should not ask questions about energies like you know when I where I can create muons. Okay? And the reason for this, I mean the reason why um, why this is happening is can be understood like in order the peculiarity can be understood from like you know perturbation theory even like in quantum mechanics let me try to ex explain a little bit like what i mean yes no for the when you're constructing the field theory and if you if you start with the like because i'm okay s in the in when i was talking about let's say the in the first part the classical fields I'm not talking about uh, quantum, they're like classical fields. So when we like, you know, want to quantize those fields, right, the quantum field theory, and those are like, you know, these are like, you know, the things I should keep in mind to make a consistent theory. Because I mean, then I'm going, if I start with the fields, I will like, you know, make them operators. And when I make them operators, I should keep in mind 
that the commutators of these operators at the same, I mean, the sa same time commutators at different points should commute. If they don't, I did something wrong. Or if they don't preserve, like, you know, probability when time evolves, that's bad because, I mean, I, like, you know, start with the probability density and, like, you know, which are, like, then it just dies out. So that's not good. So, okay. So th the problem is, okay, as I said, I'm in QED. If you have only if you only include electrons in your theory, it's good on t up to like you know you start creating muons. But there are also what's called like the virtual processes. So if you look in the perturbation theory, as probably Alto will talk about, you will have loops and you will have like you know virtual particles like you know popping in and out. And it's possible that these virtual processes, although you don't go all the way to that energy, may affect your theory and like you may not get sensible results. And let me try to tell you what I mean. If you look in the perturbation theory, the energy shift of a state psi. Okay? So this is like you know familiar to all of you from your quantum mechanics courses, I assume. Okay? And here the prime means I don't get divergences. And here, the correction to my energy is coming from all states. And there is no bound here for energy. So, I mean, the shift can be very sensitive to all states. That's possible. I mean, so it's possible, let's say, we have a cutoff for energies. Let's call it like, you know, I mean, lambda, capital lambda. And imagine, okay, so we have this cutoff, energy cutoff. And imagine we are, we, we are ignorant to the states, to the physics, which is about to such that En is greater than lambda. Okay, so if that's the case, I mean, if we have like a theory with like you know an implicit like you know energy scale, and we don't know the theory behind that like you know energy scale, so the perturbation could is a function is a very complicated function in general of lambda. So then we distinguish. Okay, this is what we mean with renormalizable theory and non-renormalizable theory. So non-renormalizable means. means that if we require if it's required that we know this like you know higher energy states to make any prediction for lower energies right I mean I imagine like you know we have we, we, we don't know the what's going on like we be above a certain energy lambda and we are looking at the processes which are like you know way below lambda you may assume, oh, we don't need to know about it. But I mean, if that's the case, I mean, if you really know, if you really need to know this, like, you know, corrections, then this is called, like, you know, this is called, like, non-renormalizable. And the problem with that is since the low energy physics is affected by the high energy physics we don't know, this energy, these, like, theories have less predictive power. Okay? That's why they, people don't like them. But in the in the case of renormalizable theories, okay. So that then then you have the second case. It's possible that our ignorance about this high energy physics can be absorbed in small number of parameters of this theory, like coupling constants or masses, okay, and then. Then we can check whether our predictions make sense or not. If they do, 
we are we can like neglect these things and can absorb the physics at this like you know high energy in this like you know in this small number of parameters then it's called we call it like uh, denormalizable and I think we could talk about it more like you know later again no no I mean the, the important no no I mean you, you are always kind of ignorant like you know I mean but the problem is um, whether the physics at the energy scale you are doing your experiments is sensitive to that physics or not if it's sensitive like if you really need to know about like you know the detail like you know structure of the at high energy then it's denormalizable yeah I mean that's 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 the second key thing I mean, coupling constantly runs with the energy. No, no, this is okay. This is no, no. This this was just only to illustrate, like you know, in these virtual processes, you get contributions from all possible, all higher energies. I mean, that was to illustrate, like you know, the thing is, I mean, you may think, okay, I mean, in the perturbation theory, you only get like you know contributions around the state, which like you know. Uh, around the states which where you are doing your experiments or like you know you're doing your right the theory but I mean even in the simplest case of the quantum mechanics if you look at the perturbation theory the second contribution the second like you know order perturbation I mean change in the energy gets contributions to all from all energies okay I think I'm, I, I'm running out of time okay I have like one minute and let me uh, Okay. I think I can finish here and continue with saying about a little bit more like you know in my two other lectures like tonight so she had a, okay wait I will share the Okay if Okay if it's sensitive to the like you know part like the high energy physics you don't know then it's non renormalizable non renormalizable so if you can absorb your ignorance in like small number of parameters like coupling constant and then the physics is I mean, then you can get the physics at the low energies then it's called like normalizable but i mean yeah as i said i mean at the very end i made Talk about a little bit more. Man, this is just like you know what you get like you know in the second order perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. I mean, this is not a field theory, right? I mean, okay. I mean, okay. So if, for example, you can put a cutoff, let's say, and like you know, for then the if the contributions of like energy is higher than this are negligible. That's normalizable. Yeah. And the spectrum, I mean, the H also gives you the spectrum, right? Because, I mean, these are the eigenstates, energy eigenstates. So you look at the spectrum. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, from that, uh, it's possible, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, the point is, I mean, it depends on the on the problem, how like you know close or separate the states are separated, in the let's say I mean harmonic oscillator. If you just like you know make the wall like you know, make it like really high frequency, then the energy separation is going to shoot. I mean, this is something like you know the theory will tell you. But as I said, this is like you know, only to demonstrate that there are like virtual processes which can contribute and like you know spoil your like you know uh, predictive power. Okay, I think let's stop here and talk about more later in this afternoon. <laughs>